All righty. Good afternoon, all. Uh, let's go ahead and get started. Hopefully you enjoyed your last uh, daily quiz of the semester. Uh, let's talk about our game plan. It is definitely winding down, but we still have a fair amount to cover. Uh, we are going to continue on with our discussion of the reproductive system. We finished off the boy version, and uh, now we are on to the uh, second level version, the female version. We started that process. Two more assignments due on Tuesday. Uh, you have a busy weekend this weekend. Not only do you have the two assignments, but remember this is your big weekend uh, to be studying and preparing for the exam. So make sure you're using that time wisely. Uh, we are gonna, I'm hoping to get through most of the reproductive stuff, if not all of it today, so that on Tuesday, all we have to do is talk about um, uh, development and fertilization and those kind of processes uh, from the reproduction that way. I don't think that stuff is necessarily hard, but it does have some fun vocabulary. So uh, make sure you're looking ahead at that, especially since you have the lecture notes to know what to expect from that. Your unit 27 review is gonna be due and you have one last lapster. I uh, see there's a question. Let me finish the overview real fast, then I'll answer it. Uh, and then we have our exams after that. Uh, Thursday, you've got your lab and lecture exam. You know what to expect from that and what that's gonna be like. And then the following Tuesday, you have your final exam. It's going to be 100 multiple choice questions. You'll have 100 minutes to complete it. And again, it must be completed during class time. Oh, great question. So uh, a question was asked about uh, how women, when they're in the same environment, can sometimes end up synchronizing their cycles. And uh, that is 100% true that that can occur. It does not have to occur uh, when you uh, put women together in a living space, but uh, it can occur. Uh, how that phenomena occurs is not fully understand, uh, understood. Uh, we certainly don't release pheromones or anything uh, that way, but there is some subtle chemical communication between individuals. And so it is believed that that type of uh, uh, information can um, help to synchronize uh, the cycles. And if you think about it from an evolutionary standpoint, this kind of makes sense because if all of the females were all pregnant at the same time and all giving birth and taking care of them at the same time, uh, there would definitely be uh, some uh, advantages to that situation in that environment. So definitely it is something uh, that can occur and has, uh, but I'm not sure that they fully understand the mechanism by which it does occur. Great question. All right. Any others? So that is the game plan. Uh, that is the things we need to cover. That was a great question. Any others before we dive back into the material? Excellent, you know how much I enjoy my stunned silences. So with that, let us go to, oops, wrong button. The lecture and bring that back, there we go. All right. <clears throat> Again, last time we left off talking about the ovarian cycle. Again, the ovarian cycle has those two phases, the follicular phase, uh, where we have the development of the follicle, hence the name, from its primordial state to its primary state to its secondary state to its tertiary state, uh, and then ovulation occurs, at which point we enter the luteal phase, driven by the uh, hormones produced by the corpus luteum and by luteinizing hormone, which also triggered the ovulation, where we get the transformation of the remaining follicular cells into this big massive glandular structure that is the corpus luteum, which eventually deteriorates to form the corpus albicans, and then the process starts anew. So we spent a fair amount of time in the last class talking about this, but as I briefly showed you, and as your book's got a nice chart that talks about, this ovarian cycle is really just one of many cycles that are going on at the same time. So we can talk about the hormones that are going on in the anterior pituitary, production and release, production and release of hormones from the uh, follicle cells themselves that we will talk about. And then ultimately uh, we will talk about the uterine cycle, which is obviously all in sync with this as well. 
Now, before we start talking about the established cycle, as we mentioned last time, it can take uh, some time for the normal mature ovarian cycle to establish in a female. In childhood, the ovaries are producing just the smallest amounts of estrogen from those tiny little primordial cells. And they're also producing inhibin. And as we know, inhibin inhibits the hypothalamus, stopping the release of gonadotropin releasing hormones. And so that stops the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. However, at the onset of puberty, there is the production of a hormone called leptin. If you remember, we talked about leptin in the endocrine system, and we talked about leptin plays a role in that sensation of satiation, how we are full, right? We were talked about how uh, this is something that's triggered from the adipose tissue uh, that makes us feel full, right? When it was first found, they thought we had finally figured out the magic pill that everybody could be thin and beautiful. You just have to pop a leptin pill and you wouldn't be hungry and you wouldn't eat and uh, everybody would be thin and happy because of course you have to be thin to be happy. And of course, we also learned that that was total BS. I mean, not just the thing about being thin to be happy is BS, but as we also talked about, uh, being hungry is one of just many factors that influence when we eat. Right? You eat because that's the time that you have break between classes, or you eat because that's the time when you get up and with your, with your kids, or that you eat because of emotional reasons, stress, anger, all sorts of other things. Hunger is one of the smallest factors that influences when we eat. However, leptin does something else as well. In females, basically that leptin is the body's way of telling the hypothalamus that the female is physically fit, is healthy enough to be able to produce offspring, right? With males, it's so much easier. You're just making the missiles and firing them off. Remember the females, not only do they have to make the gamete, but they have to be able to house and maintain it inside of their body for a prolonged period of time, 40 weeks. So by having adipose tissue, by being healthy uh, and having that adipose tissue, that adipose tissue produces that leptin and lets the hypothalamus know, hey, we are physically fit enough, we are healthy enough, we are nourished enough where we can take care of not just ourselves, but somebody else as well. And so that leptin stimulates the hypothalamus. And then of course the hypothalamus produces those gonadotropin releasing hormones. Oh, that's huge. And those gonadotropin releasing hormones of course stimulate the release of follicle stimulating hormone. and luteinizing hormone from the anterior pituitary. Right. Now, this production of uh, follicle stimulating hormone, luteinizing hormone, this production of the gonadotropin releasing hormones can fluctuate, right? It's constantly changing, it's constantly monitoring and this uh, irregularity in the system can last for well over a year. It is not uncommon at all for a female to miss a cycle or two at the beginning of the onset. So she may have her first menses and it may be three months before she has the next one. One month, it may be a 22 day cycle and the next it may be a 42 day cycle. So it is not uncommon to see these types of wild fluctuations while these hormones and the normal hormone cycles are being established. Now, again, one of the important things to remember is just because the cycles are irregular does not mean that the female cannot get pregnant. Will there be, could, let me rephrase that, could there be some cycles where an ovulation does not occur Yes, but even though the cycles are irregular, um, ovulation is still possible, fertilization is still possible. And so unfortunately, across the scope of the planet, there are plenty of 13 year olds who are having their first menses and then getting pregnant shortly thereafter. All right, but eventually, after what could be years, uh, an adult cycle is established.
All right. Questions on that? All right, let's talk about the female cycle. And I think one of the easiest ways to do this is because uh, again, we did already talk about this, but let's put it together. And again, I'm always, I obviously graphs are not things that you guys can easily produce, nor would I ask you for on a lecture exam. However, unfortunately, sometimes talking about and drawing these things are kind of the best ways to see them. So I apologize that this, if, you know, that this if, is frustrating to me because, again, we don't necessarily have uh, everything we need to be able to test you on this stuff properly, but we can still talk about what is happening and the hormones, both with our words, but also supplement it with pictures, at least for the learning of this. What obviously we're measuring here on the bottom of both of these is indeed time. And over here are hormone levels. However, we are monitoring these hormone levels in two locations. One of those locations is the production in the anterior pituitary. And what are the two hormones we are going to be uh, monitoring and caring about? So actually, let me do this. Give myself a teeny bit more room. What are the two hormones that we care about being produced in the anterior pituitary for the females. There you go, follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So we care about luteinizing hormone and we care about follicle stimulating hormone. And again, in the interest of time and space, I will just write these as abbreviations. So put that there, put that there, perfect. The other place we care about hormones being produced, are of course, from the ovary. And what are the two hormones that we care about in the ovaries? Classes of hormones. Estrogens and progestins. Estrogens and progestins, excellent. Excellent. And while we mentioned that a female cycle can vary and does vary from woman to woman, for simplicity, again, we will simply go from a day one to a day 28 cycle. So again, we'll just use the average number of 28 to look at the days for that. Now, if you remember, as we talked about at the beginning of the ovarian cycle, all we have are primordial follicles that are starting to become primary follicles. And so obviously at that period of time, and we'll use, let's use red for progestin levels. Obviously our progestin levels are gonna be next to nothing. And our estrogen levels are going to be low as well. For that, we'll use green. Now, remember, ah, we talked about how estrogen has a complicated relationship with the anterior pituitary, with the hypothalamus. So low levels of estrogen inhibit the production, or me, the release, but not the production of 
of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. So let's make that green as well. We'll put that there as a reminder for us. All right, here. But notice at the start on day one, estrogen levels are very low. And because they're very low, that means that there is little to no inhibition on the anterior pituitary. And so as a result of that, follicle stimulating hormone levels are going to start to rise. And what other color do I want to use? Please brown. Luteinizing hormone levels are going to start to rise. So at the early onset, starting at day one, estrogen levels are very low. Our follicle stimulating hormone increases and our luteinizing hormone levels increase. Of course, this increase in follicle stimulating hormone stimulates the follicles and causes the follicles to grow. As the follicles grow from primary, uh, primordial towards primary, and we start getting dozens of these primary ones that are starting to work their way towards secondary ones, these have more and more granulosa cells. And as we have more and more granulosa cells, as a result of that, more and more estrogen is going to be produced. And so estrogen levels are going to rise. Now, as we said, as it starts to rise, it inhibits the product uh, inhibits the release, but not the production of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So as a result of this, levels of luteinizing hormone level off. And the same thing happens for follicle stimulating hormone. However, with follicle stimulating hormone, not even does it level off, but follicle stimulating hormone levels will start to drop. So what happens here is we get a drop of follicle stimulating hormone. Now remember, Follicle stimulating hormone is what is maintaining our follicles. As there is less of it available, this is where we start to get the attrition of the follicles. So remember, when we get a handful of secondary follicles, but only one follicle, reaches the tertiary state. Now, while the number of follicles get smaller, the number of follicular cells themselves get bigger. The follicles themselves are getting massive. And so the amount of estrogens that are being produced continues to get higher and higher and higher and higher until something really important happens. Eventually, what happens is estrogen reaches a critical point. And at this high level, Instead of inhibiting follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone release, it actually produces, promotes production and release of a luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And so as a result of reaching that trigger stage, that high level, 
As a result of that, we get a massive spike in luteinizing hormone. And we also get a big spike in follicle stimulating hormone. And typically at what day does all of this occur? Day 14. At day 14, that is basically when reach that critical point and that triggers that release and we get that massive release of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone and the spike of that basically triggers ovulation. So there at day 14, ovulation occurs. But remember, something else happens as well. That big spike of luteinizing hormone triggers ovulation, but it also triggers the transformation of the granulosa cells that stay behind in the ovary into the corpus luteum. And what's the big difference between the corpus luteum and the granulosa cells. Corpus luteum produces estrogen and progestins. Exactly. We start to get the production of progestins and a massive amount of progestins are produced. So we get this massive increase in progestin production, something we haven't had yet. Estrogen level production is disrupted by the ovulation, but it does remember start producing estrogens as well. So we are gonna see a high level of estrogens, uh, not as high as it was before, but we will see a higher level of estrogens, but a massive spike of progestin. Remember progestins are what tell the female body, get ready, Ovulation has occurred, pregnancy could occur at any moment. The problem with this is that progestins and as we know, estrogens, and there's also gonna be some inhibins still being produced as well. All of these things together inhibit both production and release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. So while we have these high levels, levels of estrogen and progestin, what's gonna to start to happen is the amount of uh, luteinizing hormone that is being produced is going to start to decrease the amount of follicle stimulating hormone that is being produced is going to decrease. And as these levels decrease, and in particular our luteinizing hormone, the corpus luteum cannot be maintained. So our corpus luteum starts to degenerate and gets smaller and smaller. As it gets smaller and smaller, progestin levels start to drop, estrogen levels start to drop.
Come on. What's a dead line? There we go. See, I cheat, but it works. As the corpus luteum levels start to decrease, uh, pardon me, as luteinizing hormone levels start to decrease, the corpus luteum starts to get smaller and smaller. As it gets smaller and smaller, the amount of estrogens and progestins decrease until our corpus luteum completely degenerates. into the corpus albicans. Where now it is just a piece of scar tissue. At that point, our estrogen and progestin levels are low. They stop inhibiting the anterior pituitary and the anterior pituitary can start to produce and releases follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone, and the process continues. But anterior pituitary never stops producing uh, hormones, right? Or it stops producing? Well, the levels of it start to go back up. So notice at this point now that it's been brought back, that uh, the progestins are gone, uh, the estrogens are very, very low. At that point, as a result of that, what'll start to happen is that our luteinizing hormone levels will start to go back up again. Our follicle stimulating hormones will start to go back up again. And as they start to go back up again, we start to uh, develop more primary uh, follicles, more secondary follicles. And as a result of that, estrogen levels are gonna start to go back up. And again, and the whole process continues again. So this is a cycle, it's a continuous process. No, I understand, and just about it, you said when the um, uh, estrogen and progestin levels are low, uh, so anterior pituitary releases hormones, but like start to release, but not start producing them because it's always producing them, no? No, remember during this phase right here, I see what you're saying now. When our progestins, estrogens, and inhibins are being produced, so in the luteal stage, we are inhibiting production and release. So it's not like they're storing it up and still making it. They're not making it and not releasing it. Oh, okay. Here they make it, but don't release. Right on this side here, not making or releasing. Okay. Yes, thank you. Yep. Uh, here's another question. Uh, well, so what I would say is, as we see here, um, unlike the males, there are massive fluctuations in hormone levels in females during the process of their cycle. Uh, typically, at, during menses, all the hormone levels are relatively low. And as a result of that, uh, that can cause uh, physiological changes to the body, right? Uh, we talk about, uh, you know, PMS, we talk about, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, uh, emotional impact that menopause can have as there, when there's a disruption in it, things along those lines. So um, it would not surprise me that your body would behave differently at different levels of these hormones. Why specifically uh, you would have pains in your abdominal region? I'm not sure, uh, specifically your ovaries, uh, when that I'm not certain what that specific reason would be, uh, but it uh, wouldn't surprise me that it was related to changes in your hormone levels. There isn't anything necessarily about the ovary that should make it more 
tender during that phase. And again, if you, uh, as we'll talk about, for instance, when uh, progestin levels are high, uh, progestin levels, among other things, help to uh, get your mammary glands ready for milk production. So sometimes uh, shortly after ovulation, a female's breasts can get more sensitive during the second half of their cycle as a result of that. And certainly uh, in pregnancy, when those are really developing by the progestin and other hormones, uh, they, uh, the breasts can uh, swell and become tender as a result of that definitely during pregnancy, but it can also happen during the cycle. But I don't but that's due to the increase in glandular activity that's taking place. You're getting growth in the mammary glands and that stretches the tissue and makes it more sensitive. I don't believe that the ovary undergoes the same type of size change during the cycle the same way. So yeah, so I don't, I don't have an answer for you, but my guess is that it's related to the changes in hormone cycles. All right. I've done an okay job of describing this, but let's go back to uh, better pictures from your textbook. Starting first by cheating, we'll come back originally to this one. Notice here we see those changes that we talked about, but let's walk through it in the words uh, like we were talking about as well. So again, it all starts with the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is producing our gonadotropin releasing hormones, and that tells the anterior pituitary to release follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone. In particular, the follicle stimulating hormone stimulates those primordial follicles to become primary, those primary follicles to start to become secondary. As those granulosa cells are formed, right? the follicular cells form granulosa cells, those granulosa cells uh, start to produce their hormones, right? estrogen and also inhibin. Estrogen has this complex relationship with the uh, hypothalamus. It inhibits the release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone but it still continues to make it. So during this time, there is an accumulation of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone in the anterior pituitary. It just does not release it. This causes the levels to taper off. And remember, as we talked about, this can actually cause a drop in our follicle stimulating hormone levels. And that drop is what leads to the attrition of our follicles. And that race we talked about where only one follicle wins and makes it to the tertiary stage. Now, while only wins and gets to the tertiary stage, that tertiary follicle is massive, made up of thousands of granulosa cells. And those granulosa cells are producing and releasing a massive amount of estrogen. And that estrogen at a high level finally triggers the release of all of that stored up luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone. And again, in particular, in this case, it's the luteinizing hormone that matters because that massive release of luteinizing hormone, that massive spike of luteinizing hormone is what triggers ovulation. But that luteinizing hormone does one more thing as well. During ovulation, remember the secondary oocyte, frozen in metaphase two, is released with its zona pellucida around it and its corona radiata of granulosa cells. That is all expulsed. But thousands of those granulosa cells remain. And that leftover popped balloon, that ruptured follicle, is transformed by the luteinizing hormone into a massive glandular structure known as the corpus luteum. The corpus luteum also produces estrogens, just like the follicular cells did. But 
What's different about the corpus luteum is that it also produces progestins. Progestins, progesterone in particular, is the warning bell that tells the female body the egg has been released. Get ready. Because within the next 24 hours, you could become pregnant. Now, to get the female body ready, the corpus luteum is releasing massive amounts of estrogen, massive amounts of progestin, and also producing a lot of inhibin as well. And the combo platter of those three hormones inhibits, and again, I wanna make sure, because again, the question was asked, both production and release of follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone are inhibited. So it inhibits production and release of these hormones. The problem is as the luteinizing hormone goes away, so does the corpus luteum, because that's what luteinizing hormone does. Not only does it transform the follicle into the corpus luteum, but it maintains the corpus luteum. So as luteinizing hormone goes away, the corpus luteum goes away. And as the corpus luteum goes away, estrogen levels drop, progestin levels drop until ultimately it shrivels up into that corpus albicans and with no more ovarian or low levels of ovarian follicle, with low levels of ovarian hormones, now luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone can be produced again and the cycle starts anew. And here's the pretty picture of the flow chart that kind of shows this process of this relationship. All right. And here, like we said, as follicle stimulating hormone levels increase, our primordial become primary, our primary becomes secondary. But as our estrogen levels continue to go up, they inhibit the production and inhibit the release of luteinizing hormone, uh, pardon me, inhibit the release of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone and follicle stimulating hormone levels can even drop. That drop in follicle stimulating hormone leads to the attrition of the follicles until just one mature follicle remains, producing a massive amount of estrogens that massive amount of estrogens then triggers the massive release of all of that stored up follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone and ovulation occurs. That luteinizing hormone transforms the corpus luteum or I should say the follicle into the corpus luteum and maintains it. But as luteinizing hormone levels decrease, the corpus luteum decreases until it shrivels up into the corpus albicans. Once it's corpus albicans, estrogen and progestin levels are low, the blockage has been removed and follicle stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone levels can start to increase again. And around and around the process goes. And again, First to rise in estrogens until ovulation, then a massive speak, uh, peak of progestins. Estrogen levels come back after the disruption of the follicle, but not quite to the level that they were before until they decrease and then it starts anew. So questions on that. I'm still a little confused on why uh, follicle stimulating hormone drops during the first 14 days. Like what causes it to drop? Uh, my guess is that it is a hormone that is probably more likely to be uh, expulsed in the kidneys or broken down by the liver. 
So if it, if it is broken down more rapidly, for instance, by the uh, liver, then while it's not releasing it, the amount of it in the blood would start to decrease uh, more rapidly than you would see a decrease in luteinizing hormone, which is uh, likely a more stable, longer lasting molecule. Okay, so it's, it's not really related to um, the estrogen level at that point? No, because again, remember, it's still being produced, but it's not being released. So whatever's already in the blood is all that she's going to have. And so any follicle stimulating hormone that leaves the blood is going to cause that level to drop. And so my guess is that it probably has a low transport maximum in the kidney. My guess is that it probably is more readily broken down in the liver, and that's how we get rid of it. And the fact that it does go away is very important because that limits how many follicles are going to be able to mature. Remember, we saw that picture of the uh, cat's uh, ovary where they had injected with follicle stimulating hormone and it had over 20 mature follicles inside of that, right? If the female's ovary had all the follicle stimulating hormone that it needed, then she'd be giving birth to litters as well. And that's definitely not what we want. So the fact that it drops is vitally important for the attrition of the follicles. How it drops, I'm guessing at, but it is a very educated guess and so I'm probably right. Uh, but, but more importantly is the significance of the, do, uh, the drop and what effect that has on the ovary. Okay. Great question. Any others? I like questions. It means that you guys are paying attention and you're motivated and I like that. I hate this. I hate the sound of this. All right. Any other questions? What's the next graph on the bottom? I don't know. I've never seen that before in my life. <laughs> no, that's the, uh, that is the last place we have to go. And the last place we have to go is the uterus. So where we're going to go next is to the uterus and talk about the uterine cycle and how it relates to the ovarian cycle and the hormone cycle and everything else that we've been talking about. Of course, before we can talk about the ovarian cycle, we have to get back into the anatomy and start talking about the anatomy now of the uh, female reproductive tubular structures. And again, there are three uh, ducts in the female uh, duct work system, the vaginal canal, the uterus, and the uterine or uh, fallopian tubes, or also known as the oviducts. All of those are acceptable names for this. Let's talk about the uterine tubes first. Uh, they're what are the horns of our moose, as we can see here. They are, uh, their goal is to receive the egg when it is ovulated. So when that egg is ovulated out of the ovary, not drawn to scale. The goal is to get that into the uterine tube. And again, it is a goal. It isn't a guarantee. Uh, as we have talked about, the female reproductive tract is open. The uterine tubes directly connect to the uterus at this narrow region on the lateral aspect of the uterus lateral and superior, known as the isthmus. However, it does not directly connect to the ovary. Instead, it has these large funnel-like structures that sit over the top. Let's look at the proximal, we'll call this the proximal because this is the way that the egg is gonna move. The proximal part of the uterine tube about a third of the way in is an enlarged area known as the ampulla. This ampulla is where fertilization is most likely going to take place. So the goal is to get the egg into the ampulla and then the goal is to get the sperm up the passageway to that ampulla so those two kooky kids can get together and live happily ever after. That ampulla is connected to 
a large funnel-like structure. Uh, I'll just do this. There's this big, huge funnel-like structure that feeds into the ampulla known as the infundibulum. No, great question. This whole structure from here to here is the uterine, is the fallopian tube. So fallopian tube and uterine tube and oviduct are all three names of the exact same thing. So you could call this the ampulla of the uterine tube, or you could call this the ampulla of the fallopian tube. But the whole thing is the fallopian tube. I'm sure Bob Fallopian was the one who named it after him. So I don't know where the name Fallopian comes from. But uh, uterine tube is fine, fallopian tube is fine, oviduct is fine. All of those are terms for it. The infundibulum, I kind of think of like more of the hardened funnel that is the renal pelvis that we just finished talking about that receives all the urine. Or the other way that's nice to think of it is as the palm of the hand. And the reason it's nice to think of it as the palm of the hand is the hand, palm of the hand has all these fingers that stick off of it. And it's the same thing for the infundibulum. The infundibulum has all these finger-like extensions that come off of it known as the fimbria. So these fimbria are finger-like projections that come off of the infundibulum and they basically drape over the ovary. They do not connect to the ovary, but they do drape over the top of it. And these fimbria move in a wave-like motion. Their job is basically to produce currents within the um, peritoneal cavity in the peritoneal fluid to draw the egg when it is ovulated into the infundibulum. So the same way you use your fingers to grab a quarter to bring it into your hand, the job here is to grab that egg and bring it into the infundibulum. I have a quick question. Yes. So uh, the egg ovulated at any side of the ovary? Yep. Okay. And that is part of the concern. An egg that is ovulated out here is probably less likely to get into the uh, uterine tube. And so that egg that is released during that ovulation is gonna be floating around out here inside of the right, abdominal pelvic cavity. And is that going to be a viable offspring? No, right? Aside from the fact that by not getting into the ampulla, it's less likely to be fertilized. But technically, is it possible for a sperm to work its way into the uterine tube, out the, uh, out the uterus, out the uterine tube, into the abdominal pelvic cavity, and get enough here to fertilize this egg? Yeah, technically that could happen. Of course, it's not gonna do it any good because again, it needs to form attachment to something uh, where it's gonna be able to get enough hormones, enough blood supply, enough nutrients to be able to survive. And is it likely to find some place to attach itself to out there in the abdominal pelvic cavity? Yeah, but in some very rare cases, is it possible that it could find a place to attach? Absolutely. If that occurs, is that woman going to be able to bring that to full term? No, what do we call that condition? An ectopic pregnancy, absolutely. That ectopic pregnancy is incredibly dangerous for the female and it is not a viable baby that can be brought to full term, right? So unfortunately, right? Unless Trump gets his way, that will have to be uh, eliminated. And uh, because again, it is very dangerous to the woman, could likely kill the woman uh, and isn't gonna be able to be brought to full term anyway. All right. I have one more question. I have another answer. So uh, which ovary ovulated in this cycle? Can no. it be both of them or are they like in order or how it works? That is a great question. The short answer is no. 
both do not ovulate at the same time. Typically it is one or the other, but how that is determined is not understood. It's definitely not that they don't take turns. My guess is that it's more random. Remember, after all, when we're talking about follicle stimulating hormone that is released into the blood. And so maybe in some instances, more of it goes to the right than to the left, or there's one that's more sensitive to it in the left than to the right. So just randomly in one of the two ovaries, you're going to have that one follicle that wins and reaches maturity. And again, you gotta remember all of these things we're talking about are far more complicated than we can discuss in here. Because not only do these cells need follicle stimulating hormone to mature and grow, but follicles actually literally compete with other follicles. They produce chemical signals that can inhibit the growth of other follicles. So again, since those kind of things could get into the blood and could go from one ovary to another, typically you get one winner and whether it's the right ovary or the left ovary is pretty much random. Yep, now that's a great question. All right, excellent. So the goal, get that egg into the infundibulum. And again, we're gonna produce those currents in the peritoneal fluid to draw it in there. Because remember that egg is not motile. As we talked about once into the infundibulum, the goal is to move it to the ampulla where it'll be viable for about 24 to four, uh, 12 to 24 hours, in which case it needs to be fertilized. But remember, it can't move by itself. So luckily for us, the cells lining the inner surface, the membrane of our uterine tube have cilia on them that move them towards the uterus. Now, let's talk easy. This, the epithelial tissue that lines these uh, uterine tubes has cilia. So of course it is a ciliated, identify the epithelial tissue, finish it for me. It is a ciliated. Pseudostratified columnar epithelium. Exactly. It is a ciliated, simple columnar epithelial tissue. Simple? Oh. Wait, what? Simple? Yeah, simple. Remember how in the uh, epididymis of the male, I told you we found a tissue we wouldn't find anywhere else in the, in the body, and that was that non-motile ciliated pseudostratified columnar? Well, here in the uterine tube of the female, you find a tissue you don't find anywhere else, anywhere in the body. And it is actually a ciliated simple columnar epithelial tissue. Okay. So yeah, so it is the only ciliated simple columnar epithelial tissue that you have in your body. But its goal is to use those cilia and move those cilia down the length of the uterine tube. Great question. So yes, so uh, again, as I mentioned, the goal of the cilia is to get the secondary oocyte frozen in prophase uh, two, pardon me, frozen in metaphase two into the ampulla. The ampulla is where fertilization is most likely to occur. Now, remember as I wrote here on the board, the cilia in time will move that egg all the way to the uterus. But notice that pathway of the cilia moving the egg to the uterus can take three to really five or six days for that to occur. So that secondary oocyte frozen in metaphase two is it ever going to make it to the uterus if it doesn't get fertilized? Yes, it can, but it's not fertilized. Well, but if it only 
if it's only viable for 24 hours, at which point it then degenerates and is absorbed by the tissue. Does it ever get to the uterus? No. No, right? The menses is not the expulsion of an unused oocyte. The egg doesn't make it to the uterus unless it's fertilized. If that egg isn't fertilized in 12 to 24 hours, it degenerates, it gets broken down, and it just gets reabsorbed by the surrounding tissue. So the only way the egg gets to the gets to see the uterus is if it gets fertilized. All right. We will look at the anatomy of this or the histology of the uterine tube in a little bit. We'll do that at the end when we do all of our histology together. Uh, but you'll see that it is heavily, heavily invaginated on the inside. Very distinct looking tissue because again, we don't want a big open centrally located lumen in this. Because if there was a big open lumen, then that poor little egg could be stuck here in the middle with nothing to move it. So there are these massive invaginations, massive, massive folds in the uterine tube so that pretty much the entire surface of it is in contact with the surface of it somewhere else. So that anywhere in there that the egg is, it's gonna be in contact with the wall and that wall is gonna to help to nourish it. It's gonna to help to maintain it. And then it is going to um, move it towards the uterus. Great question. Um, so the question was, can you get pregnant on the period? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. Not because uh, this egg that you ovulated on day 14 is still going to be hanging around and still be present. But remember, a lot of what we're talking about in this class is that the sky is blue. More and more studies are showing that female cycles are much more irregular than they actually appear from the outer surface. And it is not uncommon for a female to ovulate uh, two or in some rare instances, even three times during an ovarian cycle or do it during an, a, a uterine cycle, because that's the part that we really see on the outside. So it is actually possible for a female to be ovulating at the time of menses. Now, the issue with that is that, again, as we'll talk about, the menses is when you are shedding the uterine wall so that it is not uh, prepared or ready to receive that egg. So even if an egg is ovulated, even if an egg is fertilized, the chances of it successfully implanting and growing are small, but it still can occur. So the same way we talked about how the withdrawal method is not a viable method of, uh, of, of uh, birth control. Uh, having intercourse during menses is also not 100% guarantee. It is much, much less likely, but it still can occur. I think the example I would use is, uh, and we'll get to it uh, next week, uh, breastfeeding. A lot of women believe that while they're breastfeeding, that breastfeeding inhibits the, the maturation and release of eggs. And for the most part, it does. But as we've mentioned many times in this class, most is not all. So I would not be surprised, even with just 24 of us in here, if one or two of you don't know somebody who did get pregnant while they were breastfeeding the first baby, they got a second one. I know someone who that happened to. Right, so they've got two kids that are uh, basically 10 months apart. And I'm sure you guys know somebody or likely know somebody who did that as well. All right. So, okay, excellent. So those are the uterine tubes. Like I said, the last thing we have to look at is the histology of it, but we'll get there when we get there. And the uterus. The uterus, as we mentioned, is about the size and shape of a pear in a female that has never, oops, never been pregnant before. It basically has three distinct regions to it. The regions of the uterus are the narrow head 
portion that actually sticks out into the vaginal canal known as the cervix. This is a thickened uh, head region with a very narrow opening to it known as the cervical canal. We have the large middle portion, which is the body of the uterus. And then we have the superior portion of the uterus known as the fundus. The fundus is the superior part of the uh, uterus. Well, great question. I'll answer that in just a second. Let's do this one first. The fundus is the superior part of the uterus. And remember, as I mentioned, as the, as the baby grows, the uterus expands. It starts from something about the size and shape of a pear to basically be able to contain a basketball. And so one of the things that is actually a very strong indication of how far along a female is in her pregnancy is the distance from the pubic symphysis to the fundus. You can actually, in a female, in a, in a female who is uh, not full term, but you know, starting probably early term, two or three months in, the superior part of the fundus can actually be palpated. You can actually palpate it in the abdominal pelvic cavity. And what they do is they measure from the pubic symphysis to the top of the fundus. And that distance actually gives the doctor a very, very strong indication of exactly how many days pregnant you actually are. They actually use that to say you are, you know, uh, seven weeks and four days uh, pregnant. They can be pretty much precise to the day. You are correct, for the baby to be expulsed, it has to, uh, the cervical canal, the cervix has to narrow and the face become more flimsy, become more loose to a massive 10 centimeters, right? I don't think I have my, my daughter stole my, my tape measure. Uh, but if you can think about, I'll see if I can find one during the break, what 10 centimeters is, right? It's a massive, massive opening uh, no, that you have to pass a basketball through. Uh, so someone answered the question, how, if it's at the top of the vaginal canal, how does the doctor know when you've reached 10 centimeters? Anyone gone, gone through it? No one wants to help her dick out by answering? Feel it. Exactly. Uh, there you go. A digital exam. Basically, they put uh, not even a tube not even a tool. They put their finger up there and with their fingers, they can measure how big the opening is. They feel how soft the wall is, give it an effacive value, and then they feel with their finger how wide the fingers, how wide the opening is. Yep, so it is indeed a digital exam. And I'm told it's a very enjoyable experience as well. Right? Not having experienced it myself, I'm told it's very, very wonderful. <laughs> there you go. Somebody said no. <laughs> it's very painful. Ah, there you go. Yeah, exactly. It's incredibly evasive. Luckily, my wife here was when I said that either. So that's good too. All right. Excellent. So that is the basic anatomy of it. We'll talk about the layers to the wall as well. But as we talked about, the goal of the uterus is to both receive that fertilized egg anchor it into the wall of the uterus, and then allow it to grow and expand in that space for 36 to 40 weeks. Right? We talk about pregnancy being nine months, it's really 10 months, but it's some of this hinky math, right? I'm pretty sure that if uh, Trump knew about this kind of math, he'd be using this as part of his, uh, his, his uh, 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 defense against all of the corruption that is going on right now. All right, because it's a, a wonky math, new, new, uh, whatever the new math is that we have. Common core. There you go. That was what I was looking for. All right, excellent. We've talked about the anatomy. How are we on time? Actually, this is a good stopping point. Let the, the wall of the anatomy is going to, the wall of the uterus is going to walk us right into the uterine cycle. So this is probably a good stopping point for our first break. Let's go ahead and take our first break. Uh, it is 1.15 right now. So we will restart at 1.30. And we will, I will restart the recording at that point as well. All right, any questions before we take our break? All right, I will see you in 15 minutes.
All righty. <clears throat> Any questions before we dive back in? All right. So as I mentioned, there are three regions to the uterus. There are also three layers to the wall of the uterus as well. The innermost layer lining the uterine cavity, which again is a mucous membrane that is open to the outside world, is the endometrium. This is the area that allows for implantation if that egg is fertilized during the cycle. But if it's not fertilized during the cycle, then what happens to the inner layer of the wall of the uterus? It's shed, absolutely. It's shed and released from the body of the immensus. <clears throat> Next, the middle layer is a thick muscular wall known as the myometrium. And of course, what type of muscle tissue is it? Smooth muscle? Smooth muscle, right? It is not something that is voluntarily controlled. And obviously its job is to produce the contractions for partuition, the expulsion of the baby. In that positive feedback process, we talked pretty much on the very second day of uh, 4.30, and now we are back around to it again on the second to last day. Lastly, we have the outer layer, which is the parametrium. Uh, the uterus is an intraperitoneal organ. So the outer layer, the perimetrium, is of course the visceral peritoneum or also, again, a serous membrane. All right, so notice we have a mucous membrane. Outer wall, I mean, you know, facing the inner surface of it, facing the outside world, we have a serous membrane, facing the inside of the body, and in between we have smooth muscle. All right, so very similar anatomy that we've seen in other areas as well. However, what's different about it is that endometrium. The endometrium basically has two distinct layers to them. The first is called the stratum functionalis, or what is commonly referred to as the functional layer. This one is the one that is sensitive to ovarian hormones. So as, uh, as ovarian hormones increase, it increases. However, as ovarian hormones go away, then we can't uh, maintain it. And so this is the part that is released and shed during the menses that we talked about. However, deep to that, up against the myometrium is the stratum basalis or the basal layer. This one is insensitive. to the hormone levels in the, uh, that are being released by the ovaries. And so it is pretty much stable and consistent in its growth and in its function. And so it is from this base that after we've shed the functional layer, we can then regrow. So basically it forms the foundation of the endometrium so that it can be released and recycled every 28 days. It is more than just producing epithelial tissues that fill up the endometrium. There's also a tremendous amount of glands, uterine glands producing uterine juice, which as we'll see is gonna be vitally important for the maturation of the egg. But the other thing that is contained within both the functional layer and the basal layer is a massive vascularization as well. There are a large number of large and long blood vessels found in this area. Here we see uh, a nice histology slide showing this. Notice again, here's we, we can use the highlighter, that'll work. 
So again, notice as we look at this here, we see the smooth muscle layer there. Then we have our basal layer, this area in between, I guess our muscle layer goes a little bit more up this way. And then our functional layer here as well. This would be early in the uterine cycle. We can see all of this in the field of view and the functional layer uh, is relatively small at this period of time. We can also see some of the large glands and also some of the large blood vessels uh, that are found within this structure as well. And let's take a nice look at the illustration here that kind of shows the same thing. Again, we have our smooth muscle layer here. Then we have our stratum basal located here. And then the functional layer above that. Here we see an example of one of those large glands that we talked about that start with its growth within the functional layer. For some reason, they have it deep into the, uh, the muscle layer, but again, that's more of our artist representation as opposed to accuracy. However, what I do want to talk about are the blood supply. Now, in the past, I have made you guys draw out or identify and trace the blood from the heart to an organ and back again. We're not going to do that, but I do want to at least briefly mention the blood flow to the uterus. It branches off the internal iliac artery. Remember, the internal iliac is the one that basically goes to the bowl of the pubic region. And from there, it enters into the uterine artery. The uterine arteries that enter in an arcuate artery that then go into the radial arteries. And again, those I don't care that you know about. But the blood vessels that I do want to talk about are the two main types of blood vessels that are responsible for feeding the uterine wall, and in particular, the endometrium. In here, there are primarily two main types of blood vessels. The first are the straight arteries. Straight arteries, as you can see, are relatively straight. They're relatively short. And their primary function is to feed blood to the stratum basal. However, notice there is a much larger artery here that has a very convoluted spiral-like appearance to it this spiral appearing blood vessel, not surprisingly, is known as the spiral artery, or what is also sometimes called the coiled artery, and that is fine as well. As you can see, the coiled artery feeds the majority of the functional layer and is much, much larger than the straight artery. But the real key to the differences between these two layers and the flow of blood to the difference to these two layers is remember how we said the functional layer is sensitive to hormonal changes, whereas the basal layer is not. And the reason for that are these blood vessels. The straight artery is not at all influenced by changes in hormone levels. But these coils of the spiral artery are. When estrogen and progestin levels drop, what happens to those spiral arteries is the spiral arteries undergo a conformational change. Without that hormone, they basically kink. And as anybody who's ever watered the backyard knows, what happens if you kink a hose? Blocks the flow. Yeah, it blocks the flow. And so when those estrogen and progestin levels drop, the spiral artery kinks and blood stops flowing to this massively active, massively vascularized, massively glandulized functional layer. And if it's not getting its blood, is it going to be able to be maintained? No. And so as a result of that, it is deteriorates and sloughs off. And that's what causes the menses. So really it's here, those changes in hormone on these blood vessels that really lead to the major changes in the walls of our uterus's endometrium.
Now, that being said, let's still put all the pieces together and talk about the uterine cycle, talk about how the uterine wall changes in relation to what's going on in the ovaries. And again, it is basically synced with what happens in the ovarian cycle. So, of course, the ovarian hormones are estrogen and progestin. There are basically three phases to the uterine cycle. And if you think back to our hormone levels, there is a stage where both estrogen and progestin levels are both low. There is a stage where estrogen is high and progesterone is low. And then there is a stage where estrogen and progestins are both high. All right. Those are kind of the three phases of our hormones from our ovaries. So not surprisingly, there are three phases to our uterine cycle. During the first phase of our uterine cycle, estrogen and progestin levels are gonna be low. During the second phase, the second phase is primarily being driven by estrogen. And the third is primarily driven by progestin. Because remember, during this second part of, uh, or this, this uh, second portion of the ovarian cycle, progestin levels are very high. Estrogens are high as well, but remember, progestins are higher. So anything leading off of the straight artery would be, would lose blood flow from that spiral artery. At, uh, pardon me. Oh, I see what you're saying, Lee. No, great question. So I, 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 just for clarification, let's go back to the picture. Clear. So yes, these blood vessels up here are more straight, but these are not considered straight arteries. The straight arteries, remember, are relatively short and basically just feed the stratum basal. So all of these are basically arterioles feeding off of the straight artery and small arteries feeding off of the straight artery, but they're all being fed by the straight artery. So when this kinks, all of this is lost, whereas this one stays consistent. But notice it doesn't connect to the functional layer. It primarily just feeds the stratum basal. How the top arteries are called? Doesn't matter what they're called. I don't, they're, they're, my guess is they're just arterioles. Okay. Yeah, so we, yeah. Yeah, my guess is that they're just arterioles feeding into the capillaries. Okay. All right. So let's work our way through the cycle. Again, we're dealing with a 28 day cycle. And we start with day one. Day one uh, through five is our menses, our menstrual phase. Again, if you were thinking of the female cycles, everything we've talked about in terms of importance, obviously, ovulation is the most important event that occurs during that cycle. So wouldn't it make more sense to make ovulation day one? Why isn't ovulation day one if that's the most important event? What do you think? Well, let me ask the question this way. 22 people in this class, I'm going to guess at least a dozen of them are female. Can anybody in here tell me the last time they ovulated? Anyone? No. Anyone else? Yeah, no one knows when they last ovulated. It's not something you're noticeably aware of, right? What about menses? Anybody know when they had their last menses? Yeah, the menses, the menstrual phase, when that lining is being shed from the body is the most obvious event that occurs. It is the most uh, easy one to track. And so typically that's how they keep, uh, well, there you go. See, someone was definitely aware of when it happened, when it started, right? And so again, it makes sense to start from that point because it's the one that is most easily able to identify. In fact, 
as we were talking about, and we were talking about that hinky math earlier, let's talk about it now. When an egg gets fertilized by the sperm, when the doctors start counting, they start counting from when you had your last menses. So if you think about it, from the way that the doctors count the number of days, the instant that egg fertil is fertilized by the sperm, it's already 14 days old because they start counting from the very first day of your last menses. So the second it is fertilized, it's already two weeks old. All right, because again, it's the obvious event that is easy to see. During this period of time, as I mentioned, uh, and again, remember, this is the part that is being driven by our hormone levels. Estrogen and progestin levels are both low. We talked about how those spiral arteries are sensitive to the levels of these hormones. So they kink, and when they kink, we stop blood flow to the functional air. And this functional layer can no longer be maintained. Since it's no longer getting oxygen, no longer being nutrients, it can't be maintained and it's left off. The tissue uh, lining the uterine wall is released. About 50 milliliters of blood uh, is released during this process as well. Again, that is the one nice thing about the kinking of those arteries. It does decrease the blood loss from this process. But like I said, there's also a lot of tissue that is lost during this process as well. And again, remember also during this period of time, because estrogen and progestin levels are low, this is when we start the production of primary and even on into secondary. Well, now by day five, we're probably not into the secondary stage yet, but our primordial are starting to develop into primary. All right, questions on that? All right, by about day five, menses is over and we enter what is known as the proliferative phase. During the proliferative phase, again, proliferate means to give birth to, give rise to. And so this is the period of time where we regrow the functional layer. Again, this is where those primary are starting to become secondary we're getting that increase in estrogen. So it is primarily estrogen that is driving this early development. As we can see from the uh, microscopy here, glands are starting to form. We can still start to see the tubules of those glands as they start to grow back into the functional layer. Our spiral arteries start to regrow. So we're getting more blood more glands growing into this area. Now, these uh, uterine glands produce a very glycogen-rich mucus, which helps to line the uterus. And as I also mentioned, is gonna help to maintain that, uh, that fertilized egg when it reaches the uterus in hopes of implantation. This occurs until about day 14. And remember, this is also the period of time that we said was the most variable. So if you have a longer cycle, it's this proliferative phase that is typically longer. If you have a shorter cycle, it is this proliferative phase that is typically shorter. Because once ovulation occurs, then it's a pretty standard, pretty close to two week process. Uh, that will uh, occur from that stage. And that is the key, as we keep mentioning. And again, look at the difference in these two light microscopy pictures. Again, here on this picture, we can see the individual nuclei lining the epithelium, those simple columnar cells lining the surface. And we can still see the myometrium. We can see all of the myometrium, all of the, the stratum basal, all of the stratum functionalis. We can see all of that there. But here, notice we're at a lower magnification. We can't even really make out the nuclei anymore. And still, all we can see is the functional layer. Massive, massive increase in growth. Massive, massive increase in glandularization. 
seeing these big, huge spiraled uterine tubes is that dead giveaway that you are in uh, this secretory stage, or what we also call the post-ovulatory uh, post stage. Massive vascularization, massive glandularization, massive release of uterine milk, getting the uterus ready for implantation. All right, because that's the goal. The uterus has to be ready for when that fertilized egg gets there. And how do we tell the uterus to get ready? Stimulate this massive growth, this massive increase in this massive uh, increase in metabolism. What drives this? What hormone in particular? Progestins, absolutely, those progestins, progesterone, right? The progesterone, remember, is that warning bell telling the female's body to get ready. And that's what it does for the next two weeks. Now, remember that egg when ovulated on day 14 is only viable for 24 hours. So maybe by day 15, it gets fertilized right there in the 11th hour. But remember also we talked about, it could take as many as five days for it to reach the uterus. Once it reaches the uterus, it can actually stay inside of the uterus for almost a week before it finally implants into the wall. So notice from the time of ovulation, at least 10 days can go by before that egg finally implants in the uterine wall. So it has to get itself ready and it has to stay ready, stay prepared for that implantation. All right. However, if after two weeks, that fertilized egg still hasn't shown up, then at that point, our estrogen and progestin levels have dropped. At that point, our spiral artery is going to kink. And at that point, we can no longer maintain this massively glandulized, massively vascularized, massively metabolically active functional layer. And so that functional layer is gonna be sloughed off and the process begins again. Right now, when we look at this graph that we've been talking about all along, again, we can see the menses where it's lost. Right, we can see estrogen driving the proliferative phase, progestins driving the secretory phase. And again, notice in the secretory phase, not only does the functional layer get bigger, but it gets much more vascularized and much more glandularized. But when estrogen and progestin levels drop, this cannot be maintained, it is shed, and the whole process starts all over again. All right. Great question. Typically, uh, the morning sickness that occurs during the, or the nauseousness that can occur during pregnancy frequently occurs in the, in the first trimester, often occurs in the morning, but not always. And so that's why it's sometimes referred to as morning sickness is primarily as a result of the changes in hormone levels. As the female body is reestablishing new hormone levels for new functions because we've gone from maintaining this cycle process that it normally does to now maintaining a baby it causes the, some dramatic changes in estrogen and progestin levels as well as other hormones, uh, human somatomammotropin and some other hormones that are produced as a, a result of that. And so as a result of that, uh, uh, that those can actually cause some, those changes in hormone levels can cause some nauseousness as it occurs. Same thing with the bad moods that occurs during menses or, uh, you know, pre-menstrual syndrome, right? Uh, PMS, 
uh, or can, you know, those kind of things, those changes, those fluctuations in hormones, the decrease or increase these. And again, you see how rapidly these are going up, how rapidly these are coming down. Hormones affect us cognitively. And so they can affect uh, our mental stability, our, our mental, our memory, all sorts of things can be affected and influenced by these wild, massive fluctuations in hormones that females have to endure. All right. Now, these hormone fluctuations, these cycles continue until basically one of two things happen. One thing that can happen is often, uh, obviously, you reach menopause and then this process stops. But what's the other thing that can happen that disrupts this process? Come on, you guys are overthinking it. Getting pregnant, there you go, exactly. <laughs> Climate change, <laughs> getting pregnant, absolutely. The main thing that disrupts this process is getting pregnant. When that oocyte is fertilized, this cycle changes. And the primary reason for that is when the egg is fertilized, it completes meiosis, It becomes an ovum. From that ovum, it becomes a zygote. And that zygote starts to divide to form cells, clusters of cells. And those clusters of cells are called blastomeres. Or also blastocytes. These developing cells, that zygote and the other developing cells, produce a very special hormone. And that special hormone is human chorionic gonadotropin. Gonadotropin, bingo. Right? HCG. This human chorionic gonadotropin that is produced by these developing fertilized egg cells, what they end up doing is they end up maintaining the corpus luteum. Normally, we know that as luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormones decrease, our corpus luteum gets smaller and our hormone levels of estrogen and progesterone uh, decrease as well. But what human chorionic gonadotropin does is it maintains that corpus luteum. So the corpus luteum stays big and massive and functional. It does not degenerate, it does not go away. And if it doesn't degenerate and it doesn't go away, then that means that our progesterone levels stay high and our estrogen levels stay high and our uterine wall is maintained and we stop producing more follicles and it stops the whole system. So this hormone, this human, oops, let's, exactly. So this hormone is only produced by one thing and one thing only, a fertilized egg. As we know, our urinary system has transports that bring things like hormones, bring things like chemical signals out of our filtrate back into our blood but we also know they have a transport maximum. So once enough of this human chorionic gonadotropin builds up in our blood, 
when it gets filtered by our kidneys, not all of it is gonna be brought back into our body. And so some of it is going to be released in our urine. So what do you do with that pregnancy test? You pee on a stick, exactly. And that stick is looking for the presence of human chorionic gonadotropin. <laughs> okay, even that's a joke even I wouldn't make, but all right, there you go. Excellent. You pee on that stick, and as a result of that, um, you, uh, <laughs> you uh, they test for that. Now, obviously, as we just finished talking about it, the, the day you are pregnant, is there going to be enough human chorionic gonadotropin where you'll be able to sense it by peeing on a stick? No. However, if they take a blood test, can a blood test be more sensitive and, and, and indicate pregnancy earlier than the urinary stick test? Yes, because there we can look for the direct presence of it in the blood and we don't have to worry about what's being filtered out. So that is the big key to disrupting this process, right? Stimulates the corpus luteum, maintains the corpus luteum, maintains the... Um, progestin and estrogen levels, which do two things, right? The first thing that it does when estrogen levels and more importantly, progestin levels stay high, one thing that it does is it maintains the uterine wall. So the uterine wall stays full, stays intact. But the other thing that it does is it stops the maturation of more follicles, right? Because it is suppressing follicle stimulating hormone, more follicles do not develop, which makes sense. If you're pregnant with baby one, do you wanna be working on eggs for another baby at the exact same time? No, of course not. Which is also why, as we started to learn and understand this, what was the very first type of female oral contraceptive? Progesterone pills. Basically what they would do is they would give you three weeks of progesterone pills. Every day you'd pop one of those progesterone pills that would keep your progesterone levels high in your body and would stop the eggs from maturing. Of course, they felt that you still needed to menstruate so that's why I only got three weeks worth, because then you stopped for a week, your progesterone levels plummeted, and then menstruation occurred. Of course, the problem with that is people always would forget when they last took the test or, or the pill or when they stopped that. So then um, they would give you three weeks worth of progestin, and then what would they give you? I think they still have them this way. Are all the pills in your capsules? Yeah, sugar pills, a week of sugar pills, basically as a placeholder. So you still have something to do. So now it's part of your ritual. Every morning you pop that pill for three weeks, it's a real pill. For one week, it's a sugar pill. It, uh, it stabilizes your menses. It often can uh, decrease the severity of the menses, can decrease cramping. And again, that was early on, and they still use progesterone for that as well, but now there's even more hormones and other things that they use that do the exact same thing. But that's essentially how a, a uh, that is essentially how a, um, brain is locking up, um, how an oral contraceptive works. All right, questions on that? All right, we have put all of the pieces together then. And again, here we have the hormonal effects uh, associated with uh, the, all of the things that they do and all of those effects for all of our cycles. Excellent. All right. It's a little bit early, but again, this is another good uh, stopping point. We only have a little bit more we need to finish now. Now that we're done with this, we need to finish the rest of the female reproductive track. Uh, we need to talk about the external genitalia, the accessory structures, 
uh, and then we need to do the histology. But like I said, this is a good natural stopping point. So let's go ahead and take our, uh, what I'm guessing is second and likely will be our last break. It looks like we'll probably finish a little bit early today. Uh, so let's go ahead and we will restart at 2.20 and I will start the recording at that point. All right, see you in 15 minutes. Any questions before we dive back in? All right, we've talked about the uterine tube. We have talked about the uterus, the last part of the ductwork system uh, for the female that we need to talk about is the vaginal canal. Uh, the vagina is an elastic muscular tube that extends from the cervix to the exterior of the body. Again, as we saw and seen in that sagittal section, uh, it is in front of the bladder and the urethra and in front of the rectum and the anus. So remember, these are three separate openings uh, within the outer surface of the female's body. The vagina has three functions. What are the three functions of the vagina? Come on, you guys are awake. This microphone's on, right? That's right for a baby. Okay, excellent. So it is a passageway for the baby to come out. Of course, what has to go in for the baby to come out? Sperm. Right, it's a copulatory organ. It has to receive the penis, receive the uh, semen to be able to do that. And so then what's the third function? We just finished talking about it. If you don't receive the semen and you don't have a baby, then what happens as a result of that? Menses, exactly. So either menses or a baby comes out and it is the copulatory organ. So those are the three main functions of the vagina. Again, if you think about those functions as we've talked about, uh, these aren't relevant until the female is sexually mature enough, right? And as we've talked about, the problem with the female reproductive tract is that it is open to the outside world. So one of the ways that the female is protected uh, with the vaginal canal is near the distal orifice of the vaginal canal, there is a large fold in the mucous membrane that mostly but does not completely close uh, the vaginal canal. This fold in the mucous membrane is what is known as the hymen and basically it partially closes. We don't want it completely closed because as we talked about, menses has to be able to come out, but we do want to restrict that opening to limit the types of materials and, and things that could get in because as we talked about, harmful pathogens that can get inside uh, can cause severe issues for the female. This hymen is typically well vascularized and also well innervated so when it is ruptured from the insertion, uh, typically uh, of a penis is one of the primary ways that the hymen can be ruptured. Uh, it can be painful and it can uh, bleed as a result of that. However, hymens can vary dramatically in their integrity. Uh, some of them can be thin enough and flimsy enough where vigorous activities like riding a horse or running even uh, could be enough to cause that hymen to rupture. And in some instances, the hymen can be thick enough and sensitive enough uh, that insertion is too painful to allow it to rupture and it actually has to be surgically removed. All right. So again, we did that. That's what's going on at the distal end. At the proximal end, I remember as we talked about, the head of the cervix comes out into the vaginal canal. That forms this, uh, basically what is essentially a ring around the head of the cervix uh, where it is inserted into the vag vagina. So where it basically sticks out into the vagina. 
uh, this uh, is called the vaginal fornix. And uh, this used to be more significant uh, from a birth control standpoint, because one of the uh, early potential um, female reproductive devices, uh, or, or not reproductive, but uh, um, um, prophylactic devices, was a structure called a diaphragm. Basically, when you would go to your gynecologist and your gynecologist would actually measure the size of your fornix. And then basically they would make a flexible ring that had a rubber diaphragm around it. And so that when a female wanted to participate in sexual intercourse, she would have to take that diaphragm and insert it up into her vaginal canal so that that rubber diaphragm covered the head of the cervix. When inserted correctly, especially if the female would put some type of spermicide inside of it prior to putting it on. So you'd put spermicide inside of the cup of it, insert it into place. It had a 100% efficiency of stopping pregnancy. So why aren't we still using it today? Well, I mean, there are still some people that use it, but it isn't nearly as common. Why isn't it nearly as common? Absolutely. One of the major ones is proper placement is a key. Again, it is 100% effective when properly put in place. So this one was a lot more challenging to get it properly placed into the location. And if it's not fully set in there and firmly set in there, as we talked about copulation when done properly should be vigorous. So there's the chance of it slippage. Uh, and then again, if it slips, then that opening becomes available for the sperm to get in. That can be an issue. What's the, the second reason, probably the most prominent reason is that while it is 100% effective at stopping pregnancy, it is 0% effective at stopping sexually transmitted diseases. So there's still the major issue of infection that goes along with that. And of course, there's the awkwardness of it. You had to go to your doctor. They had to measure your fornix. They had to send away to it. Then when you're out on that date and feeling amorous, you've got to excuse yourself to the bathroom where you take this rubber disc and insert it into yourself. So it was awkward as well. Right? Condoms are much easier, much more efficient. Uh, ways of doing that, but it, it, again, but not as effective for pregnancy, but much more effective at uh, sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, yes, the insertion of a tampon is capable of rupturing a hymen. In many instances, the opening of the, uh, the opening still present in the vagina is capable of receiving a tampon without rupturing it. Uh, so it is possible to use tampons without rupturing the hymen. Uh, but it, I believe it does increase the likelihood because as it's inserted in there, uh, you do run more of a risk of rupturing it that way. So it is possible to use a tampon without rupturing the hymen, uh, but it can increase the likelihood of the, of the hymen rupturing. Yes. But yeah, it's quite, quite possible to use it and still maintain the hymen. All right, do, 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 we got that. Like most of the structures we have talked about, there are going to be three layers to it or three coats to it. We have our mucosa that lines the cavity. And obviously it's a mucosa, so it has a, a real R connective tissue that we call a lamin appropriate based on its location. But what type of epithelial tissue lines the wall of the vagina? Non peritonized. Exactly. Well, time to wake up. A non keratinized, finish the rest of it. Stratified. Um. 
There you go. Excellent. Again, this is an opening to the outside world. So again, we want that thick protective layer to protect us from harmful outside pathogens. And the vagina is a copulatory organ and copulation involves friction. So we need to make sure that we protect that lining with a thick a layer of cells to maintain the integrity of that environment. Notice, as we see here in the illustration, the mucosa and uh, the areolar connective tissue underneath form large invaginations known as rugae. We have seen those rugae before, right? Ribbing, lining the inner surface of that. And why is that important? What are the rugae good for? What have we learned that rugae are good for? Expansion, absolutely. Because again, remember, we have to expand to accommodate that baby uh, that is coming out, right? You got to pass the basketball through there. So being able to have elasticity uh, to the wall, having uh, that elastic tissue, having those rugae are going to allow them to expand. However, are those rugae going to serve any other function as well? Yeah, exactly. Also for copulatory reasons. Absolutely. Again, remember the goal of copulation is to produce offspring. And to produce offspring, you need the male to release the semen into the vaginal canal. So by adding additional ribbing to it, basically increases the stimulation. That increased friction, increased stimulation, right? Speeds up that uh, sympathetic positive reflex we talked about to Right, and make copulation uh, more successful, more likely to uh, to uh, to terminate with uh, ejaculation. Right, so it's ribbed for his pleasure. Right, just like the condoms. All right. Oops, I don't know why both of those came up, but they did. But let's look through them one at a time. Like most of our hollow organs, we've talked about, it is lined with a muscularis. What type of tissue is the muscularis of the vagina? Well, you have a one in three chance of getting it right. And I'll tell you right now, it's not cardiac muscle. Smooth muscle. So I've got three votes for smooth, four votes for smooth, and one for skeletal. But for those of you who have a vagina, can you contract it? Yes. No. You oh. cannot. What you may, what you can do is contract your urogenital diaphragm around the vagina, thereby narrowing the vagina. Uh, that again can be used for stimulation of males as we were talking about. Uh, but you're using your levator ana, you're using uh, your mus the, mus the skeletal muscle of your levator ana, of your urogenital diaphragm to do that. The muscular wall of the vagina itself cannot be uh, contracted voluntarily. So it is indeed smooth muscle, right? So again, we do think of that again, you, 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 it, it feels like you are contracting it, but really what you're doing is contracting the muscles around it uh, when you do that. And it is below the peritoneal cavity. So it's not a retroperitoneal organ, it is below the peritoneal cavity, but as such, it is anchored in place by an adventatia. But remember, in this case, we don't want it completely locked in place. We need it to be able to expand to accommodate uh, the expulsion of that baby, as well as the insertion of the penis as well. So it has a very fibroelastic outer layer that anchors it in place, but allows it to expand. All right. I have a question. I have an answer. So I heard from somebody that after they give birth for the third baby, um, the doctor said that if they didn't start like strengthening their uh, abdominal pelvic cavity, their vagina would fall out. How is that possible? So it's a great question. So I, I, if you remember, we actually talked about this in 430. So if you remember, our urogenital diaphragm 
basically is the levator ani muscle and, uh, and, and some other muscles as well that basically support the vaginal canal, they support uh, the urethra, they support the anus as well. And in particular, if you remember, within the uh, urogenital diaphragm, the levator ani is where the external urethral sphincters are located, that skeletal muscle. And so as we talked about, this levator ani muscle, which elevates and supports your pelvic region, we elevated it for defecation to help to release the feces. We voluntarily relax this so urination can take place and we contract it so that it can take place. And so it supports and holds all these things in a place. You're absolutely correct. The expulsion of a basketball through the uh, vagina, va vaginal canal, out into the real world stretches this muscle. And if this muscle is weakened, then it can't provide the support that we were just talking about. So often a, a female very shortly in the day or two after she's given birth and even for the first couple of weeks after she gives birth, if she coughs too vigorously, if she sneezes, one of the effects of that can be the release of a little bit of urine because that increase in pressure pushes on the bladder and normally, our external urethral sphincter would be able to keep it closed, but it's been weakened. And so a little bit of urine sneaks out. Well, it's the same thing with the vaginal canal. This muscle supports the vaginal canal. So what can happen is that if this muscle is too weak, it can actually descend out of the abdominal pelvic cavity and actually actually be put back in place surgically. This is what we call a prolapse where it suspends below the levator ani muscle as a result of that. And so as we learned in 430, what are the uh, exercises you can do to strengthen that levator ani muscle so that these things don't occur? Kegel exercises, excellent. All right, with that Kegel, you contract your levator ani muscle. Again, think of like if you were, the, the, the best way to, I can describe what a contraction of this muscle is like is if you think about if you were urinating, and during urination or micturating, right, if you're release, avoiding urine from your body and you contracted that muscle to stop the urine mid-flow, mid-stream, that's basically your levator ani muscle. So basically what you do is you contract that muscle, you hold it for a count of 10, and then you relax it. And then you do it again, you do a set of 10 of those. And the nice thing is you can do them all the time. Right? You can do it while you're standing in line at Starbucks. You can do it while you're sitting at a red light. I've just done four of them while we were sitting here right here. Right? So you do that, strengthen that muscle, and that helps to support all of the viscera, not just the uh, anus, not just the urethra, but also the vaginal canal as well. Absolutely. Excellent. Great question. Any others? All right. Now that we have talked about the duct work system, let's talk about uh, the physiology of it a little bit. It is a mucous membrane, but remember its goal is protection. Its goal is copulation, right? And its goal involves friction. So within the actual mucosa of the vagina itself, there are no mucus glands, glands that could affect the integrity of it. Now that doesn't mean that it isn't lubricated. It does indeed need to be lubricated. And instead it is primarily lubricated internally by mucus glands that are located in the head of the cervix. So that head of the cervix that sticks out into the vaginal canal is what produces not just a mucus, but a very glycogen rich mucus. Why would we want to produce a glycogen rich mucus in the vaginal for the vaginal canal? What do you think? Spice it up a little bit, add a little flavor. Why might we want a lot of glycogen in that environment? Well, so there's an, I, I, that's a great answer. I like that. P H. 
what do we want the pH of the vaginal canal to be? Remember, we want it to be acidic. Remember, we made that joke that I love so much. The vagina is a hostile environment. We want it to be acidic because it is an opening to the inside of the female body to the outside world. And we need protection. And just like on the surface of our skin, lining the vaginal canal are a massive amount of bacteria, right? Now, again, anytime I say bacteria, people go diving for Purell, especially these days, even though Corona is a virus. Uh, but when I say that you're covered with bacteria on the insides and outside surfaces of your body, remember that is usually a good thing because these are resident bacteria and they are not harmful to us. They outcompete other potentially harmful ones that come into the environment. And so by having that resident bacteria, they provide protection. And of course, these bacteria are going to love that glycogen in that mucus. Of course, when bacteria make ATP, how do they make ATP? Do bacteria have mitochondria? No, so they make ATP anaerobically. And as we know, when you break down sugar without oxygen, what do you get as a result of that? Acid, lactic acid. Acids, exactly, lactic acid pyruvic acid, acids. And so the anaerobic respiration of the bacteria make the vaginal canal an acidic environment. There is one small problem with this. These bacteria and this glycogen-rich mucus uh, occurs in mature females, but during adolescence, and at the very onset of puberty, the vaginal canal is actually alkaline. There are two potential implications of this. The alkalinity of this environment uh, makes uh, reproductive tract and urinary tract infections more common in younger uh, women than in elder women. Remember also, as we talked about, sperm uh, swims slower in acidic environment. This may also be one of the reasons why, right, that married couple have to try for months to get a baby, whereas two teenagers pretty much just have to look at each other and she gets pregnant, All right? The uh, decreased acidity, the more alkalinity of the uh, adolescent and teenage a vaginal canal may be one of the reasons why there tends to be a higher rate of pregnancy in those younger uh, ages. All right. So uh, what I would say is it isn't that the alkalinity increases the motility, it's more that acidity slows the sperm down. So an acid environment slows the sperm down. So you could turn that around the other way, yes. And so then in an alkaline environment, they swim faster. They swim, and if they swim faster, more of them are more likely to get to the egg and that increases the likelihood of fertilization. All right, questions on that? So the sperm, uh, remember the spermatozoa don't make it alkaline, but remember the, uh, uh, the semen, which contains primarily uh, fluids from the prostate and fluids from the seminal vesicles uh, are relatively high in pH. And so that helps to neutralize the acidity. Remember the pre-ejaculate produced by the cowper glands uh, is uh, alkaline in nature to try to neutralize some of the acidity. So yes, yeah, so so the so the sperm arm, but the semen does have components in it 
that help to neutralize the acidity. From the medical point of view, when woman is considered as adult, not adolescent anymore, in from the medical point of view. I understand what you're asking. Uh, what I, that's a great question. I, it's not like, you know, at 22, there's a switch that turns where suddenly it goes from alkaline to acidic. What I would say is that as a female continues to mature, the environment of the, vag of the vagina becomes more and more acid, acidic. Uh, as she ages. So I'm not sure it's necessarily, it's not like a switch that turns on and off. And just like the onset of menstruation is highly variable between women, I'm guessing the rate at which this occurs is highly variable per one for women as well. So, so ones may be much more acidic, much more rapidly and others, it may take longer. Okay, thank you. Yep. All right, the last thing we need to talk about is the external genitalia of female, what we commonly refer to as the vulva. But again, as we've talked about, uh, an anatomists for the most part are just horrible, horrible people. And there are just so many ways that we see this. They like to plant their flags and everything and put their names in it. Uh, but there's so many other ways they show this as well. The term vagina comes from the root of the word sheath because from an anatomist's point of view, that's its function. It is a sheath for the sword. And another classic example of this is, thankfully, it is not used nearly as much. But uh, the term for the external genitalia of the female is a term called pedendum. And pedendum comes from the root of the word for shameful. Because right? again, this unfortunately is a very, very male driven field and uh, unfortunately a very male driven society. Right. And again, uh, we love to think of this being in the past, but you still hear about court cases about whether or not the fact that a female was wearing a skirt is grounds for her to be raped by some college frat boy because she was asking for it by what she wore. Right, and whether no means no, and all the other things that go along with it. Unfortunately, this is the type of society we live in, and there are plenty of examples like pedendum of this. But when we talk about the external genitalia, we talk about this region at known as the vulva. Uh, vulva is often sometimes incorrectly used interchangeably with vagina, and that is not the same. All of these structures in here is the external genitalia collectively are what are known as the vulva. As you can see, uh, this starts with the area known as the mons pubis. The mons pubis is a fat pad that sits on front of the pubic symphysis. Basically, upon puberty, uh, whereas males tend to see an increase in muscle mass and an increase in bone density, uh, in females, we see an increase in adipose formation. We, as we talked about earlier, kind of understand why this comes because again, that adipose is fuel showing that the female's body is healthy enough and strong enough to be able to uh, develop a second person inside of them. And so one of those areas where you see an increase in adipose is in the hips uh, in the butt and also in this fat pad over the pubic symphysis known as the mons pubis. This mons pubis is also the location where those secondary hair that we commonly refer to as the pubic hair uh, start to grow. Although as you can see from this illustration, those hairs will grow along the lateral aspects of the vulva as well. The vulva basically is defined by two main folds in the skin. Uh, this first fold in the skin, these labia, uh, known as the labia majora. These are the outer folds. These are continuous with uh, the rest of the skin of the body. So they are lined with a keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. They are glandularized in the same way that the rest of our skin is with sweat glands and sebaceous glands and all of those things. And as you see from the illustration, uh, this is also skin where pubic hair, secondary hair can grow as well. 
Inside of the labia majora are two thinner, hairless, a less keratinized labia, and these folds of skin are known as the labia minora. These labia minora, uh, like I said, they cover the three entrances, well, two of the three entrances we talked about, the urethra and the uh, vaginal canal. They form a space known as the vestibule. And like I said, these typically are more vascularized. Uh, they are typically less keratinized. Uh, they are also hairless. So they're more sensitive, they're hairless, and they're less keratinized than the skin around them. And they basically form the boundaries of a region we call the vestibule. If we look in the vestibule, we can see that there are four main openings that are found in the vestibule. Although your picture here from your textbook cheats a little bit and shows a fifth. The uh, largest and the most obvious one that we've talked about is of course, no, that's a horrible color, let's pick this one. Our vaginal canal that you can see here. And again, they've put a ruptured hymen in there for whatever reason. But there are four other openings in there as well. So what I would say is that they are poorly keratinized. They're not quite a mucous membrane, but they're not quite keratinized either. If you think about it, it's similar to the red margin of our lips. The red margins of our lips is not fully mucous membrane, but it's also not fully keratinized as well. So it has that same sensitivity as to the, um, the, the red margins of our lips, of our you know, the superior and inferior oral labia. The second opening is the opening to the urethra. Now, if you look closely at this illustration, let me use a really tiny arrow. If you look really closely, you can see that there are two small dark spots that they have put around the opening of the urethra. And I believe that is our model maker, our artists here, interpretation of the paraurethral glands or what are also known as the skein glands. However, these glands, if you, let's do a quick drawing here. If this, I don't want that to be so thin now. If this is our uh, external surface of the body, and this is the urethra, and then that makes this the vaginal canal. There are a pair of glands known the paraurethral glands. And these pair of glands are located uh, essentially in the urogenital diaphragm. Kind of like we saw with the bulbal urethral glands. Like the bulbal urethral glands, their ducts also feed into the urethra. Well, we've talked a lot in this class about homologous structures. So these paraurethral glands must be homologous to the bulbourethral glands or the Cowper glands. Does that seem reasonable? It does seem reasonable, but it turns out they're not. So again, they feed into the urethra, not actually outside the body like our illustration shows here. And it was thought that they might be homologous to the bulbourethral glands, except for two major issues. One is that they become active upon orgasm and not upon arousal. Remember, the bulbourethral glands uh, become active upon arousal, releasing a clear, thick, viscous, mucousy secretion that helps to facilitate copulation. That's not what happens here with these periurethral glands. These periurethral glands become active upon orgasm. 
because they become active on orgasm, they release their secretion into the urethra. And so some females upon orgasm, they feel the sensation that they need to urinate and may actually void secretion from their urethra upon orgasm. But it's not urine and it's also not uh, the, uh, the, the, the mucousy type of secretion that would be produced from the homologous uh, uh, bulbal urethral glands. Now the secretions of this have been tested and monitored and it's found that the secretions are actually similar to what are found in the male prostate. So these skein glands, these periurethral glands appear to be homologous to the prostate and not to uh, the bulbal urethral gland. So even though its location is similar to the bulbal urethral gland, it is actually homologous to the prostate. And there is one more way this structure can be similar to the prostate as well. Remember with males, we talked about that importance of palpating the prostate to uh, monitor the size and the surface of it for prostate cancer. And remember how we talked about for some males, the palpation of that gland is quite pleasurable leading to very intense orgasms. Well, turns out the same thing is true for some females as well. Stimulation of these periurethral glands, which can occur from insertion into the vaginal canal and basically palpating the superior surface of the vaginal wall towards the urethra the palpating of these periurethral glands uh, can, for some females, cause an intensive orgasm as well. And so it is believed that these periurethral glands and those that are sensitive to it are that mystic G-spot, right, that uh, some females have and others do not. All right. I love when I talk about these things and the class is just stunned silent. It makes you feel any better. It's done silent when we're all in the classroom too. Although when we're not all in the classroom, nobody likes to look at each other during this part. All right, <laughs> taking notes. There you go, exactly. All right, questions on that. As I mentioned, we also have the opening of the vagina there, but there are two other openings located here as well, here and here. There you go, exactly. Pass that information on. Um, I'm here to help. All right, these two additional openings are, as you can see, adjacent to the vaginal canal, but posterior and lateral. These connect, and I will cheat and use my highlighter. These connect to short ducts to small glands that are located deep within the, uh, the region of the female here. And these are the greater vestibular glands. These glands become active upon arousal. These glands produce a thick, viscous, mucusly, clear secretion to help to neutralize acidity and facilitate copulation. These greater vestibular glands are the ones that are homologous to the bulbal urethral glands in males. So notice, a female has no homologous structure to the seminal vesicle, which makes sense. Its job is to feed the sperm, produces the majority of the semen. Obviously, females don't produce semen. But they do have a homologous structure to the prostate. They do have a homologous structure to the bubble urethral glands as well. One becomes active on orgasm, one becomes active on uh, arousal. So not surprisingly, there are a lot of similarities, a lot of differences too, but a lot of similarities between the function of the female and the male reproductive systems. So those, Go ahead. So those glands are simulated before decapulation? They become active before, uh, so they, they become active upon arousal. 
So when a female gets aroused, again, that can be from uh, you know, physical manipulation, that can be from speech, sound, vision, whatever it is that floats your boat. It, when a female becomes aroused, those glands become active, just like a male, uh, the, their bulbourethral glands become, start to produce a pre-ejaculate upon arousal as well. I have not looked at it, but let's take a quick peek at this. I'm hoping that this will be here. Because I'm hoping there's a picture. Great question. Yes and no. Uh, but yes. <laughs> so here's what I would say. Um, Obviously, the only way she's going to get pregnant is if she's ovulated an egg. But with a female orgasm, and as we'll talk about this, when a female orgasms, those orgasms produce a reverse peristaltic contraction in the, vag in the vaginal canal and the uterus. So basically what happens with the reverse peristalsis is it makes it easier to draw the sperm up to their ultimate destination. So it, it does, it can help in the, uh, in the likelihood of, of it can increase the likelihood of fertilization occurring. You still have to time it the same way. And remember, as we talked about, uh, a female doesn't have to uh, be, you know, again, uh, some of the things that we've heard over the past two years are truly atrocious, uh, right? Uh, you know, there was a Senator who, uh, or a congressman, there wasn't a, it wasn't a senator, but a congressman who stated that a female can't get pregnant unless she wants to, right? So that, so rape can't cause pregnancy because if the female isn't, is, isn't really into it, then she won't get pregnant. So if she was, gets pregnant, then she must've been into it, right? No, that's not the case. A female does not have to be aroused. A female does not have to orgasm. Uh, uh, and as we talked about, there are chemicals like the prostaglandins in the semen that will cause those reverse peristaltic contractions of the vaginal canal and the uterus. But uh, orgasm also causes them, so it does indeed make it more likely. So it can actually help with pregnancy. Um, so why some women, so I, I, would, I, I would be hesitant to use the word never I would say that for some, it may be more difficult than others. And there are many potential re reasons for that. Uh, one of them is that arousal in females is much more mental in many cases. Uh, uh, so uh, the, uh, so th th it's much more emotional. So those are so there are a lot of psychological hindrances that could limit a female's ability to reach orgasm. Uh, again, as we talked about, it requires that parasympathetic reflex for the arousal uh, that then leads to the sympathetic orgasm. So those are things that could influence and affect it. Uh, it also it, it requires a different type of stimulation. Uh, some females can are more likely to orgasm from manipulation of the vaginal canal, whereas others uh, require more, like we talked about the skein's gland, or we haven't even talked about the clitoris yet. Uh, so um, the females can be more, let's say it this way, the females can be more variable in the ways that can cause them. So what I would say if a, if a woman has never orgasmed or has difficulty orgasm, then I would encourage her to try different types of stimulation to find that thing that they uh, that, that suits them best. Um, yes, and again, that's the whole point of those vestibular glands. And that's what I was, I didn't get a chance to look at this yet, but let's look at this here in your, so we'll get to all of that. This, uh, oh, this is the one I want, but I want it lower. There we go. Excellent. So here we see the vestibule in the chart that is in the classroom. So again, we have uh, the, uh, the labia majora has been cut. We can see most of the adipose that is in that, although here we can see the erectile tissue and the muscle that lines the labia majora. We'll talk about that in a second. Here we see the urethra. Here we see the vaginal canal with an intact hymen. But this is actually what I wanted to show you here. If you look closely, 
uh, this small gland with its duct coming into the side, and obviously there would be one on this side as well, that is that greater vestibular gland. And yes, its job, just like the uh, bulbourethral gland, is to facilitate copulation, right? To uh, provide lubrication, to provide, uh, to neutralize the acidity, to help to facilitate copulation and facilitate fertilization. All right, I think I got all the questions. I don't think I missed any. Did I miss any? All right, I think we got that. All right, excellent. So notice what we have here is this diamond shaped a dotted line that represents a region that is known as the perineum. Now, this dotted line isn't just randomly decided on here. There are, as you can see, four primary bony features that define the perineum in both males and females. Basically, anteriorly, it's the pubic symphysis. Posteriorly, it's the coccyx. And then laterally, it's the two ischial tuberosities. And notice if we peel away, uh, wait, I thought I had that picture. I guess not, oh. There's a picture in your textbook where they peel away all that pesky person. And when you see the bone underneath, you can see those four uh, features there. Now notice we talked about the openings that are found in the vestibule, but there is one additional structure that is partially located in the vestibule, and that is the clitoris. The clitoris is homologous, as we will see, to the corpus cavernosum. Right. The urethra doesn't pass to through it, and it is basically erectile tissue. What we see of it that sticks out here into the vestibule is the enlarged head region. It has a glands, just like the penis has a glands. And just like the penis, there is a fold in the mucous membrane, a foreskin that wraps around it, that is, of course, called the prepuce. Now we talked about how that prepuce is removed in males, right? Uh, again, maintaining the function of the penis, of course, in that process for cultural, social, religious, medical reasons. Is the prepuce in females typically removed? No, typically no. However, are there societies that do what we affectionately like to refer to as genital mutilation, where they remove the pupils and the glands of the clitoris in females. Yeah, Africa is one of the areas where uh, can be, uh, it is still quite regularly done even these days, unfortunately, as a result of that, right? This genital manip manipulation occurs, of course, because the clitoris is a heavily innervated uh, uh, structure that is often uh, pleasure pleasurable when it is stimulated. And as we all know, females are evil and they will lure good men to their demise. So if we remove their glands and their prepuce so that they don't enjoy sex, then they're less likely to have it and they can't corrupt poor innocent men. And that's exactly why they do it, Eric, because they're idiots, right? And fortunately, it is about control. And fortunately, it is about control. It is about, you know, uh, uh, um, maintaining uh, dominance over females. And it's one of the ways that unfortunately males show that. Right there, again, it's not quite as much. We talked about the removal of the glands and the prepuce. There are also some uh, societies that will actually suture the vaginal canal closed to ensure that copulation does not occur until uh, she is given to her husband. So it is her husband who gets to cut those strands 
and is therefore assured that his evil, evil uh, woman hasn't been off corrupting young men before he got a hold of her. Yeah, exactly. All right. Here we at least see part of the removal of the skin. And so what we can see is the full structures of the clitoris. Again, here we see the glands, which is what sticks out into the vestibule, but there is also a body. And then notice also it has two tapered ends, like we talked about in the corpus cavernosum, known as the crua. Again, a singular is a crust, uh, the two is the crua. Exactly, similar to the concept of a chastity belt, but, uh, but absolutely more brutal. So it anchors it to the pubic symphysis, much in the same way that the penis is anchored to the pubic symphysis. However, remember also notice how we talked about that there is also additional erectile tissue within the labia majora. So that the labia majora also become engorged with blood upon arousal as well. Why might that be useful? the advantage of having a swelling to the labia majora upon arousal and during copulation. Exactly. It, one of it is to maintain the penis within the vi vagina during copulation. Again, remember the goal is fertilization and if fertilization is going to occur, you have to keep the penis inside of the vagina until copy until uh, orgasm occurs and the uh, semen is released. And then also that by uh, enlarging and swelling the labia majora, it helps to keep the semen inside because obviously the sperm have to get to the egg if fertilization is going to take place. So we did that, we did that. All right. Now, again, remember in males, we talked about smooth muscle contractions. We talked about blood vessel dilations. And we talked about glandular activity. These were the three big events that occurred during arousal and orgasm. And guess what? These are the same things that occur in females as well. Again, in females, it's still point and shoot. Arousal is a parasympathetic reflex. So we get the dilation of the blood vessels that engorges the clitoris and engorges the bulb. We said why the bulb engorges. We didn't talk about why the clitoris engorges. Why do you think the clitoris engorges during arousal? Exactly, more stimulation. Some believe that it plays a role in also stimulating the penis, but as we also talked about, it is heavily innervated. And when it engorges, it becomes very sensitive and typically is a pleasurable sensation. Again, if the goal is to, you know, pro propagate this, you know, propagate the species, continue the species going on, then you pretty much want the individuals to want to have intercourse so that they can have offspring, right? As many of you uh, remember, as we talked about, I'm not sure so much that it increases orgasm, although that could, like I said, it can help, but it's not required for fertilization to take place. But I think it's more about making sure that the female wants to do it again, right? Many of you have gone through the process of giving birth and was it an enjoyable experience? Anybody come out of it going, that was awesome. I want to do that every day. No, it was not. No, exactly. No, it probably wasn't, right? If a male had to pass a baby through any part of their body, this species would be doomed because the first guy would have been done it and been like, no, that's it. I'm out. I'm not doing that again. But luckily, there's two things that happen. Uh, females get that, uh, that rummy pregnancy brain 
that helps them not to remember the events so vividly. Uh, but whereas males who've experienced it or observed it uh, take, <laughs> take uh, 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 it's burned in my brain. I remember very well. But also the fact that sexual intercourse is for the most part enjoyable. And the yeah. fact that both males and females like it make it more likely to continue. That was exactly what I said when I uh, gave my first birth to my first child. I said, I never come back again. Yeah, exactly. And yet you guys are blemish or punish it and you do it again. But they came three times more. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. So there you go. <laughs> exactly. All right. So we have the blood vessel dilation, uh, increase in the likelihood of copulation, uh, increased glandular secretion. Again, upon arousal, it is the greater vestibular glands and the cervical glands. Don't forget about those cervical glands uh, within the vaginal canal, increasing lubrication in there as well. And we get smooth muscle contractions as well. Now remember, they don't have an ampulla in the same way to release sperm, but there is going to be smooth muscle contractions. Uh, there may be some in the vaginal canal like we talked about, but also uh, the erection of the nipple is a smooth muscle contraction that occurs. Again, increasing sensitivity, increased enjoyment for the female, making the female more likely to want to propagate the species. Orgasm, just like in males, is a sympathetic reflex. And uh, again, we have um, glandular activity. We have smooth muscle contractions. Here, the vaginal wall and the uterus begin a reverse peristalsis. Right, again, if you think about it, the normal path that, uh, of the peristaltic contractions that a female has, is out the uterus, out the vaginal canal, right? Anything harmful that's in there, we want to discharge that out. The menses needs to be discharged that way. So normally everything goes out. But uh, orgasm for a female causes a reverse peristalsis that draws the semen up the vaginal canal and up the uterus to try to get it to the uterine tube. Right, so we're getting those powerful contractions. And again, we talked about how the uh, prostaglandins in the semen can cause these, but obviously an orgasm produces the more powerful contractions that way. And we get increased secretions. Yes, the, 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 the cervical glands, yes, the um, greater vestibular glands can become more active. But remember, as we also talked about on orgasm, uh, those um, those periurethral glands, the skein glands can become active. And remember, as we talked about, they release that uh, secretion into the urethra. Uh, some can produce more than others can that way. But even those that produce a little bit, like I said, they may get the sensation uh, upon orgasm that they need to avoid urine or they need to urinate. And so for, for some that can be a scary sensation, but it's really just that uh, periurethral gland producing that secretion. So notice there are a lot of similarities between males and females, but what's one of the big differences? Well, there's two. One is that obviously this is not required in the female for pregnancy. A male must be aroused, must orgasm to uh, produce offspring. But a female doesn't need to be aroused. A female does not need to orgasm for pregnancy. That's the obvious one. But what's the other difference? especially in terms of orgasm. Well, as we talked about, males have a period of detumescence. What did that mean again? Come on, I know you guys are out there. A refractory period, a period of time where they cannot be aroused and cannot orgasm again. Do females have a refractory period? Do they have a period of detumescence? No. Um, so here's what I would say. I would say that there is no formal refractory period. There's no formal stage of detumescence. Um, but there are individual variations. Some females are more capable of multiple successive orgasms 
whereas others may need a short down period in between. Uh, but those aren't, those are probably more psychological than physiological in how those affect. So, so it, I wouldn't say it's direct that way. So, it, so some may have a refractory period, but, uh, but it is not required. And there are some that don't. So there are some that can have, you know, three, four, five orgasms in a row. All right. Questions on that? All right, with that, that is everything that I wanted to handle for lecture time with one minor exception. As I talked about on Tuesday, we are gonna talk about development, we are gonna talk about inheritance. I know you're gonna do the labster, so I'm not gonna to have to spend as much time on the Mendel stuff to make sure that you understand that. But as we've talked about many times in this class, uh, biology is like learning a new vocabulary, a new language. That is especially true in anatomy and physiology. That is especially true in genetics. So there is a lot of vocabulary that goes along with this next part. Right. Gestation period. So we talked about basically 40 weeks, but anything over 36 is considered uh, full term. But again, remember, it counts from the last menses till the time of birth. So remember, as we talked about, when that egg gets fertilized, technically you are already in your second week of your gestation period. That gestation period is typically divided up into three trimesters. The prenatal period is the period of time, everything up to birth. And it is primarily divided up into two main stages. The embryological developmental stage, which is everything up to about nine weeks when that bundle of dividing cells is known as an embryo. And the fetal development stage, which is basically everything from nine weeks to birth, in which case that bundle of cells is known as the fetus. Now, obviously there is the time difference here prior to nine weeks versus after nine weeks. But the real big difference with these is where the hormones come from. In embryonic development, hormones are coming from the corpus luteum located in the ovary. However, at about week nine is when the placenta forms. Once the placenta forms, the placenta is the primary organ that is responsible for providing the hormones necessary for development and ultimately birth. And so once that, um, once that, uh, 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 that brain freeze, I lost it, uh, the um, placenta, once the placenta forms, then at that point it is considered a fetus and we've reached the fetal stage. Lastly, the neonatal period is everything from the first month after birth. And of course, the people who study and focus and work on this are obstetrics. Many obstetrics are also gynecologists. So they take care of all parts of the hoo-ha, both inside and outside of pregnancy. Now, there are literally classes that spend the entire semester just talking about these processes. What we are going to do on Tuesday is primarily focus on this part right here. All the events that occur from fertilization to implantation. This is gonna be the majority of what we talk about on Tuesday. And then once we implant, we're gonna fast forward to the end of the story, the last chapter, when expulsion takes place. So again, a lot of vocabulary uh, that you have to deal with with this. So again, get used to it, get familiar with it, start looking at it ahead so you know what to expect. All right, that's our goal for lecture. The last, last thing that I wanted to do today 
is finish up our histology. We don't have too much left, but there's just a little bit, but I wanna make sure we have the time to go through it. We left off last time and we had looked at all of the boy stuff we needed to look at under the microscope. And we had also looked at the uh, ovary. So that means what we're left with is the oviduct and the uterus. So let's take a look at those. One of the most obvious structures is the uterine tube. Remember, the uterine tube is job is to receive the egg and the egg is not motile. So by having these massive, massive elaborate folds inside of this tube, it dramatically increases the surface area so that pretty much anywhere the egg goes inside of this, it's gonna come in contact with the wall of the uterine tube. And even though we can't really tell from this magnification, what is the epithelial tissue that lines these folds of our uterine tube? Remember guys, I know the histology, I'm doing this for you. There you go, it is a ciliated, simple columnar epithelial tissue. Excellent. Here we have another picture. Again, there is nothing that we've looked at that quite looks like this. These massive, massive folds, massive, massive invaginations that make it so simple and obvious. This one is a little bit of a closer magnification. It's not quite as, uh, as close as it could be, but even at a slightly lower magnification, it should be pretty easy to tell that for the most part, all of the nuclei are fairly uniform. That outer layer of cells is a simple columnar epithelial tissue. We can't quite see the cilia here, but we can see that this definitely has fairly uniform organization where all those nuclei line up like ducks in a row, which is what we expect to see with a simple columnar epithelial tissue. All right. And again, that's pretty much all we need for that one. So that was the uterus, right? That was the uterine tube or oviduct or fallopian tube. This is the uterus. Now, obviously this is not a human uh, uterus. This is a rat uterus. There's no way you'd get a human uterus all on one single slide. But in this slide, we can clearly see, right? Here is pretty much the division of the muscle out this way. Here we have the basal layer and here we have the functional layer. So we can see our endometrium, we can see our myometrium, and then we can see that visceral peritoneum on the outer surface of it as well. But again, normally we want to look uh, at the inside and based on what we see here, what stage of uterine development would this be? What do you guess? Well, what are the two stages in, well, really, okay, secretory, or what's the other one? Secretary phase, and what's the other one? Luteo. Uh, well, not follicular. Follicular remembers when we're talking about the um, when we're talking about the uh, uterus. I mean, the uh, ovary. We have the secretory phase and the proliferative phase. There you go, proliferative and secretory. Which one comes first? Secretory. Proliferative comes first. 
proliferative remember is when we're forming the new layer and then secretory is when we're getting huge and producing all that secretion uh, getting ready for the egg to come well let's and move the, say go ahead and menstrual phase also right true but remember the menstrual phase there we wouldn't see any uh, functional layer so that functional layer would be completely gone so the fact that we see any functional layer tells you that it can't be uh, uh, the menses, menstrual phase. And being the smart, sophisticated student you are, when you've looked at your histology slide, you see you're only responsible for the uterus in a proliferative and in a secretory state. Sorry, give me one minute. All right, well, let's come back to it. Again, here we see the entire uterus. Again, a big, thick muscular wall, a little bit of stratum basal, and then here we see the functional layer. The functional layer has some glands, but are the glands massive? No, this is clearly our proliferative phase here as is this one here. Again, very clearly see the border between the smooth muscle, the slightly darker uh, basal layer next to that, and we see that functional layer. Again, you're gonna see glands, but compare this to what we start to see here. Notice how much larger this is getting. Notice how bigger, you can start to see all the coils, the big, huge, massive lines of glands in this functional layer. So notice during the secretory phase, these glands become massive. You can see many of the twists and turns of their coils. The overall magnitude of the size of the functional layer compared to the other layers becomes truly massive. So this one is clearly secretory. This is clearly secretory. This is kind of on its way to being, notice it's getting much longer, but it doesn't quite have the glandularization. So this is probably late in the proliferative phase. All right. Oh, I went the wrong way. Sorry. Here we've got proliferative. Here we've got proliferative. So based on that, what do you think we have here? Is this proliferative or is this secretory? I think secretory because a lot of glands are here. True, we do see a lot of glands, but do you see all of them? Are they all twisty and turny the same way that we saw? And look at the size of it compared to... So it's late proliferative, right? I wouldn't even say it's late. I would say, notice the size of the basal and the size of the functional are probably pretty similar. So I would say this is pretty early in the proliferative phase. But again, it should be pretty easy to distinguish. When you see more tissue than glands, you are in the proliferative. When you're seeing more glands than tissue, you're in the secretory. Okay. All right. So oh, here's another great one. Look at that one. Very, very clearly in the secretory stage. Again, these glands become huge, they become massive. And again, that's the problem. They can't be maintained. These are highly metabolic, highly active cells that are growing immensely. And when that spiral artery kinks, then these highly my body, my metabolically active cells that were getting all this oxygen and nutrients before aren't getting that oxygen and nutrients. And so it dies and it sloughs off. Again big massive, massive glands, and then there's that. All right, so again, I knew there wasn't a lot left, but I did want to at least go through it together to help. All right, questions on any of that? That is all I have for today. So it looks like today we get to finish a little bit early. Uh, study hard this weekend, do what you need to do to get prepared, 
so that we can do that little bit of uh, developmental stuff. And then, uh, then we're done. One more lecture to go. All right, you guys have a good day, safe weekend, have fun, study hard. See you on Tuesday.